Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. We have a delicious segment for you. It's Meathead Goldwyn and his new cookbook. It's called Meathead, The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling. Well, Meathead, welcome to Anderson's in Naperville. Uh, it's great to be back in Naperville. I, I used to live right near here for many years. Yeah. And thank you for coming to our LaGrange store. I, I, I'm so sorry I missed the event, but I heard it was incredible. Oh, so. the LaGrange store is really cool, and it's just yeah. really nice to have a, a brick-and-mortar bookstore in the neighborhood. A town isn't whole without one. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, we believe that, but it's so nice to hear it well, from, from authors, too. Uh, yeah. it, you, the fact that you're still alive attests that I'm not alone. People love the smell, the feel of books. It's going to be years before the, 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 all the bookstores die. No, it's going to be. I think we're here to stay. I, I hope think so. we're definitely here to stay. So this book, and I know it took you a long time to put this book yeah. together, but there are there's so much to it. So I know we can't even dip into what's in this book in a half an hour. But the book's been out since May 10th. Yeah. And so it's a little over two months. And what are, you, what are you hearing from people? Because this is this must be. I mean, you're already your website's already huge, and what you do to reach people who are so interested in what you have to tell them. But what now that you have this book out? What are you it's hearing? It's gotten extremely good reviews. Um, uh, the uh, Chicago Tribune, the Fort Lauderdale uh, Sun, the Boston Globe, several other papers have all turned over the front page of the food section to a review of the book. And recipes. It's been in almost all the food cookbooks. I mean, the, the, the cooking magazines, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and um, there hasn't been anything negative said yet. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think it's it's really incredible. But the science of great barbecue and grilling. I think this is just so so incredible that you're doing this because, you know, kind of reminded me that you're you're pretty much the Alton Brown of the grill, right? <laughs> Because you have a quote that's from him. That's an honor towards, to hear that, yes. But you have a quote. And that's what I, when I heard about this book and what you do, that's, that's instantly what I thought of. Because I used to love to watch Alton Brown oh, yeah. talk about the science and why things are, you know, makes things better when I you're I have a little cooking. shrine to Alton in oh, my do you? office. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, I, you know, there is a genre of food writers now, that, and, and you may be aware of it, but I don't know if the public is. Yeah. Um, we're all very interested in not just step one, step two, step three, but why am I doing step one, step two, step three? What happens if I skipped step two? Um, it goes back to Harold McGee's book on food and cooking and mm -hmm. Shirley Corher's baking books, Cooks Illustrated, mm -hmm. um, Alton Brown. I, you know, in the art world, they have these movements of the, the, the Impressionists, the Cubists, well, in the book world, we're the nerdists. We're the food nerdists. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of nerd stuff in the book. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, the old saying about you, you can give a man a fish, he eats for one day, give a man a, teach a man a fish, he eats for life. We teach him how not to get it stuck to the grill. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of techniques, oh, a lot I'm of concepts sure. yeah. in the book. Because grilling can be extremely frustrating. It is for me, you know. And so it's great to have something that gives you some of the the real basics, but why you need to do those things. Right? Yeah, and how. Yeah. And how, um, yeah. I mean, people don't realize there's three different kinds of heat in the grill. They don't realize there's at least four different kinds of smoke. And so we talk about what makes them different, what happens when heat hits meat, when it hits the protein, when it hits fat, when it hits collagen, when it hits uh, water, and the, the reactions are all different. Right. So your, your, your website, AmazingRibs.com, you have so many people who follow you on that website and, and, and tune into that. And that was over 10 years ago you started that website? Started it in 2005. Okay, so about 11 years. So what was the impetus to, to, to do a cookbook finally? Have people been asking you to do this? Or what, what was the there was some it? requests for it. Um, I'm just an old guy. And I, 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 you know, I mean, I've been on the Internet since uh, the early 1990s um, when, when I was doing wine things and you had to type, you know, type R-E-D for red wines and type W-H-I-T for white wines. Uh, uh, going back that old, I ran AOL's early food and drink network. And so I've been around the net for a long time. And it does some things really well, but it does some other things really poorly. It's not a good place to learn. Um, a book is how you learn. A book has a beginning and a middle and an end. And when you're teaching a concept, 
you want people to start with the basics and work and progress through um, and make your way towards the advanced concepts. And what happens is, is people will parachute into a website, a, a, a barbecue brisket recipe maybe, right. and then they'll read, uh, there's a link to take some to how to make a rub and a link to a sauce, and then there's a discussion of um, why we cook at low temperatures, and they go, and so they're gathering knowledge like an Easter egg hunt, and it's, you just don't learn the same way. Sure, a book sure. is the only way to teach. So, so you know the essentials of this and, and learning it and and grilling is so you know you talk about thermodynamics yeah. and the science of this and, and and I think I think any nerd griller is going to be totally getting into this. So tell us a little bit about the science and 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 I know you have someone um, who is actually a, a physicist, a and, a physicist food scientist. Yeah. and a food scientist. I've collaborated with uh, a number of scientists, most yeah. notably Dr. Greg Blonder at Boston University. Right. Dr. Blonder was head of research at Bell Labs for many years. Um, he's a food scientist also. He, um, he just stumbled into the website at one time and we started a conversation via email and I asked him about a perplexing phenomenon and he said, well, I'm not sure why that happens, but I can find out. Uh. And so we talked and he designed an experiment and did a test and we broke the code on what causes the barbecue stall. It's a phenomenon where the meat temperature goes up to a point and then stops and stalls for hours and it won't progress. And uh, we, we figured it out and uh, ta taught the world and it's now accepted. And so we started doing that asking, I as a journalist and he as a scientist, we're trained to ask the same question. How do you know this to be true? Uh. How do you know what you have been taught is fact? Um, how do you know what the candidates say from the podium is true? Um, seek the facts. And uh, we did a lot of that. And there's a lot of myth busting in the book. We, yeah, sure. we take on the myth of soak your wood chips. You don't have to and you don't need to and you shouldn't. We t take on the myth that bone-in steak is, tastes better than b b boneless steak. And we explain why. And mm -hmm. The first half of the book doesn't have any recipes. Right. It's all. I don't. I don't want to use the word textbook because you already used the word thermodynamics. No, no, we'll scare no. Them I, away. No, we're not. No, not <laughs> at all. No, 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 no. But it's so interesting applying these things and to understand because so many people find grilling, you know, sometimes it can be frustrating. But if Baffling. you know some of the basics and why then it's going to really well, help you be better. Particularly for us yeah. hairy knuckle draggers who've never had a cooking lesson in our life. I mean, I learned to grill from my dad. I mean, okay. I, he took me out sure. back when I was about 10 and I watched him sizzle the steaks and the smell was so great. And yeah. I was, the fact that he let me sip a little beer along the way might have helped. <laughs> and you know, we learn from our parents. We learn from sure. our fathers and mothers how to cook. And uh, often they're just passing down what I call old husband's tales. And right. uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of error in them. And we set out to find out if they're true or not. Right. You know, I think I think one of the things, and, and I, I love the names that people give you, the, the barbecue whisperer. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. The BBQ that that was actually, yeah, a radio interviewer that called oh, me that. Yeah. That's so great. But, you know, I think one of the misconceptions, the biggest thing is that people don't understand the difference between heat and smoke. So tell us a little bit about that. Because well, there's actually three different kinds of heat on a okay. grill. You, you have direct, when you're directly above the, the, the heat source, like charcoal or gas jets, um, you have infrared radiant heat, and that's like the glow of the sun beating on the back of your neck. It's very intense energy, um, and it's very directional. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you set up your grill, as we teach people to do, with two zones, you put all your heat on one side mm -hmm. and no heat on the other. Um, if you have all the heat on one side, that side is heated by radiant heat, but then the air is heated and it circulates onto the other side where there's no heat and it's still warm over there and that's convection airflow. Ah. And that's just like what you have in your oven. You have convection airflow. Um, uh, there's also heat from the metal cooking surfaces, the grill grates, and that's what makes grill marks. Mm. Um, so you have infrared radiant heat, indirect convection heat, and conduction heat. And they all work on the food. They all mm. work on the meat or the vegetables whatever you're cooking, they have an impact on the flavor. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's so interesting. So, um, 
you, know, you have so many things, the way the book is set up, you know, starting off with the science of it, but then, mm. you know, you go into the equipment and the sauces yeah. and the rubs and everything. And it's kind of it's kind of like setting the stage for, for all the recipes that are included in it. And then you conclude the book, it's so great, with some great sides. So I want to know, how did you set out to set this book up, organize it, and then before we sat down, you said you did the photography for it too. Yeah. Yeah, it just seemed so yeah. logical to make it flow. I mean, let's start yeah. with understanding the concepts. You know, you cook too hot, turn down the temperature, separate the hot side from the indirect side, um, use good thermometers so you know what temperature right. you're cooking right. at. You couldn't cook indoors if you didn't know what temperature it was. The dial on that grill is a piece of garbage. You can't mm. tell. It's worthless. It's up here in the dome, and you're not going to eat the dome. You're eating the food down below. Techniques, concepts, equipment, how your grill works, because your grill and my grill are different, right, how right. the different grills work, um, and teach the techniques that you use to cook well. And then we tried to come up with good recipes that exemplified the techniques that we taught. Right. So you know, I think people are considering this sort of like the Bible for grilling, and and you know, it's in been some way, that. yeah. I know. But but thinking about how it works, what what is it about barbecuing and taking people outdoors, and whether you're 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 cooking with someone yeah. or you're having you're having friends over and you're just having a good, what is it about that experience that draws people Boy. and want them to become? You know, you know, sort of nerds now about we're, Now we're into psychology, okay. and that's kind of out of my territory. <laughs> but we do love it outdoors. Yeah. And a summer day, yeah. we do love to, you know, come home from work. And who wants to be in a hot kitchen? Love to sit out back with the dogs and the kids. And, uh, um, and, and, and we do love to play with fire, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> particularly guys, you know. Well, I, girls do too. Okay. More and more, about 20%. <laughs> of the audience is female and okay. on the website now. And there are more and more there. I, you know, it's a mystery to me because if you go back to Homo erectus, which was the first of our ancestors to cook, all the cooking was done by the women. So the first pit, pit masters were pit mistresses. Um, the guys were the hunters. You know, they come back with a dead animal and flop it over there and fall asleep <laughs> or something. And uh, the women did all that. So I don't know how the guys got control of fire. How did we steal fire from the women? Yeah. Probably related to how we stole the remote control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't I like know that. how. No, no, because no, it's, it's so interesting how some men, some guys, all they do is grill. They don't do oh, yeah. any other cooking Summertime. In, when they go inside. Yeah, but just, it's yeah. all that summer. And then you have the phenomenon of one guy is grilling, but the other five guys are standing around telling him he's doing it wrong. <laughs> exactly. exactly, that is so true. So the, 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 book will, the book will settle those arguments. <laughs> okay, all right. So how long did it take you to put Because there's so much to this book. Well, uh, it's a lifetime of yeah, expertise. Right. Uh, uh, I'm uh, 67 years old and I started cooking by my dad's side when I was 10. So it's 57 years of, uh, uh, of outdoor cooking, but the last 10 years really intensely and right, sure. seriously and taking lots of notes and measuring and uh, weighing and doing all that stuff, mm -hmm. um, uh, but the actual producing of the book was about two years, and it took about fifty percent of my time. Uh, the other half working yeah. on the website yeah. and yeah. and stuff like that. And there was a lot of cooking involved. I uh, I hired a, a Cordon Bleu trained chef to work with me so we could taste things together. Because you know when you're tasting things. Especially if after you've worked for it, on it for two hours or three hours, mm -hmm. it tastes wonderful. And then you hand it to somebody, and they go, yeah, yeah, "Oh God, what are you thinking?" It's like, "Oh God, what am I thinking?" Yeah. You know? So it's really good to work with another person when you're developing recipes. Right. Well, and also too, I think for a cookbook, you do this without any kind of recipe. You just so putting it down is a different step. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah. some of the recipes, which you know, like what we call last meal ribs, everybody loves ribs, and this is a pretty much a tried and true technique. Uh, the rub recipe is original, and people love it. They, a lot of competition teams are using it. Um, but the method and the concepts are pretty standard for classic mm -hmm. southern style, low and slow, smoke ribs. Um, so there's not a whole lot of innovation or invention there, but it's part of the classic barbecue canon. Right. We had to have how to do steaks. We had to have burgers. Um, but we also got off the beaten path with some fun stuff like 
there's a there's a smoked uh, potato salad in there. It's really good. Uh, we did uh, smoked eggplant baba ganoush. Um, Ooh, I love that. There's a smoked marinara or grilled marinara sauce. It's wonderful. You grill tomatoes, carrots, celery, onions, and garlic until they're all soft and limp. Then you pull the skins off the tomatoes, throw them in the blender. If you want, you can strain them, but you don't have to. Leave it a little chunky. And it has a concentrated flavor, Ooh, a richness, yeah. and a little bit of that outdoorsy uh, flavor. Yeah. And uh, I use it on eggplant parmesan. I grill the eggplants. Uh, it's great on pasta, on a, on a meatball sandwich. Uh, it's just a lot, and wow. you can make like a gallon of it. Oh, yum, yum. You know, I noticed that you dedicated the book to your wife, Lou, and, and she is a chemist, um, a PhD in microbiology and yeah. food safety. She's an expert. Yeah, yeah. So you, I you can to... eat at our house and feel safe. <laughs> She's constantly preaching yeah. at me and teaching yeah. me about food safety, and uh, uh -huh. there's, the, the website has a huge section on food safety and what you need to know, written in English, not in science language uh, uh, but um, you know there's a lot to be thinking about out there sure. uh, consumer reports just did uh, a test of 300 chicken breasts and found 90 percent of them had pathogenic bacteria Ooh, yeah. uh, so you need to know what temperature to cook it to right. to make it safe you cook it at long, you cook it to the right temperature and it's safe you don't don't be afraid that there's bacteria there right. but if you cook it to the right temperature it's safe but you have to know the temperature. You have to use thermometers to cook right. nowadays. People who poke the meat with their fingers, um, it just you just can't tell. Right. I, I know if, if I'm the chef at Morton's Steakhouse, I can poke the meat with my fingers because I cook the same steak a hundred times a night. It comes from the same herd of cattle. I'm using the same oven. I can tell by poking, but I, I cook a lot of food. Yeah. And I use a digital thermometer. It'll give me a reading in two seconds. And I know it's going to be perfect medium rare. And I know it's going to be safe. Right. I know what I'm doing. I don't have to make excuses when I serve the food. So it's kind of on the flip side with people overcooking on the grill. And that yeah, would, that well, would be I mean, me. you don't want to overcook steak. <laughs> right. I mean, well, no, it, because it saves you're, prices. You, yeah, because you're overcooking thinking that you want to make, you know, make it safe. Right, so, right. So yeah. that thermometer is you key. Have to, all you need yeah. to know is get yeah. it to the right temperature and you're good yeah. to go. Yeah, So, So, t you know, there, there's a lot of stuff you talk about in here and the, 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 you can do things different ways. You know, mm -hmm. charcoal versus gas. Mm -hmm. So wh what are the differences? Because people have both kinds. That's you know? the eternal question and it's a, gunfights have ensued from that <laughs> de debate. Um, um, on its own, charcoal can produce more energy. Um, if stacked up three or four deep, it will put out a lot of infrared energy. Um, a single tube uh, of gas jets generally cannot. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of new gas grills have what they call sear burners, which get really hot. But in general, gas grills just can't get as hot as charcoal. And when you want to create a dark surface, a uh, seared surface, it's a chemical reaction called the Maillard reaction, and you need heat. And so for steaks and lamb chops and other things, I prefer charcoal. Okay. But uh, come on, on a Tuesday afternoon and we want to eat, um, throwing um, some chicken breasts on the grill, you can go for the grass, gas grill, it's just as easy. There's a little more flavor from the charcoal, not a mm -hmm. lot, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you light the charcoal properly and get it all white. But you can also use wood for flavor and you can't get that flavor any other way. Right. So. Uh, it's also very convenient. Gas is very convenient, sure. very easy. There's less cleanup. Um, uh, so it's easier to start and easier to shut down. Uh, charcoal's a little messier, although some of the new grills, like the Weber grills, have an, a gas ignition and then a really easy cleanup. So they've taken yeah, a little bit of the yeah, effort right, out of it. Right. So a lot of this book, you are busting a lot of myths, you know, mm. just like the, 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 you know, the myth busters. Those I like guys to do are, that. Um, I know. And, and the one of the ones is like, people think if you sear things, it's going to make it. Sear in the juice. Seal yeah, in the juice. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, that, that idea began in the 1800s. It was a German chemist, and he first posited that searing meat seals in the juices. Um, it, you don't have to be a 21st century chemist to prove it wrong. Uh, they don't. Um, the muscle fibers 
do not slam shut when you apply mm -hmm. heat to them. There's a lot of juice in that meat. It flows back and forth. And if you're observant when you cook, if you, you've noticed that if you take a steak and you sear it on one side, then flip it, before long the juices start pooling on the surface. Um, there are other tests you can do. You can sear one steak and not sear another, cook them to the same temperature, mm -hmm. weigh them, and the seared steak actually weighs less. It's lost more moisture than uh, the one that wasn't seared. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's not true. And, uh, geez, you know, pe there are just pe people who just won't accept that. They've yeah. been told this and told this. Um, somebody got into an argument w on Twitter with one of the na national sportscasters, of all people, and he was call they were calling each other names. They called me and the referee the fight. <laughs> and and, and, I, and I, I tried to explain to the sportscaster, and he ends up calling me names. <laughs> you know, there's there's, there's religion yeah. around oh, grilling. Yeah, there is. You know, maybe yeah. it's part of that fire. Uh, it must be. Yeah, you know? gather around a campfire, yeah. you know, that tribal yeah. thing. I don't know what Drinking beer, that you see exactly. God when you drink beer, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so your website, AmazingRibs.com. What got that started? And I noticed you have this this pitmaster club. So tell these us a little bit about questions. that. These are fun questions. These are good questions. Yeah. I haven't yeah. been asked these before. Okay. Um, the website started as a lark. Um, I spent many years in the wine world. I was the wine critic for the Chicago Tribune right. and the Washington Post, and I published a magazine. Right. I was on the U.S. wine tasting team, um, so I was I was into wine in a big way, and I right. was getting tired of it around 2000 and. Uh, uh, it was getting a little bit prissy, and I just decided it was time to reinvent myself. Mm -hmm. And I always loved food, but at the time, the Internet was really catching on, and I thought, you know, maybe I should do something with the Internet. And so um, I started building websites, thinking I could make a web a living as a web construction guy, utilizing web technology, my photography skills, and my writing. And I started this little barbecue site just as a demo of what my right, skills sure. were. And um, it took off. People started coming to it. And I figured, and they started asking me tough questions. And I figured I'd better give them good answers. <laughs> and uh, after about four or five years, uh, it was making enough money that I could uh, make a living at it. Right. And now it, 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 it supports four families and... Uh, uh, it's great. been appraised yeah. at, with a very high yeah. value. And Meathead, how did you get the title of Meathead? Because oh. I'm thinking of Archie Bunker, That's right? it, that's <laughs> it. Uh, my dad used to uh, call me Meathead. We oh, were on opposite yeah. sides of the political spectrum. And uh, he, uh, if you've ever watched the Archie Bunker show, Archie and his son-in-law, which was played by Rob Reiner, mm -hmm. Uh, couldn't have been more diametrically opposed uh, yeah. if they were Hillary and Donald. Yeah. And uh, Meathead, the uh, the son-in-law, Rob Reiner, was uh, uh, the uh, the liberal. And I had long hair and bell bottoms, and Dad was just a tough old yeah. conservative. He wasn't a bigot like Archie, but uh, and so he. I, once I came home from college and rang the doorbell, and uh, he looked through the peephole and said, "Who's there?" <laughs> and then I told him, he said, yeah. well, you don't look like my son. You better go get a haircut. Yeah. And he wouldn't let me in until I got a haircut. So. Oh, my gosh. How funny. Oh, jeez. Well, so yeah. when I got in a barbecue, the name Meathead stuck. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. So you've had so many varied experiences, you know, from, I mean, you went to the University of Florida. You got a degree in journalism. And then you got a degree um, Master of Fine Arts from the Art Institute mm -hmm. of Chicago. I mean, you talked about your wine experience, writing for the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune, and all of these things. All of these experiences have, have got to inform what you're doing yeah. now. I mean, they've it's, all it's, kind of funneled yeah. together. And yeah. they, I right. mean, this is a writing, photography, cooking um, expedition, and uh, yeah. internet, and so they sure. all just kind of played together. But having a long resume of experiences comes with age it's yeah, not but, yeah. so much talent related no <laughs> but it but it all it all comes together i think it's so it's so interesting how you've done all this together so and also too i noticed that you have lectured um at the cornell mm -hmm. um, school of Administ hotel administration yeah. and then also at the cordon bleu here in chicago yeah. so tell us when you talk to students what what is your biggest piece of piece of advice that you give them about food service and stuff like that. 
Well, the, the best thing, what's always on my mind is that when you address an audience, you have a wide range of expertise in the audience. And you have some people that really know a lot, and you mm -hmm. have some people who know nothing. Yeah. And it's really hard to address them both. When I was at Cornell, um, I taught one summer school in the classroom right next to Carl Sagan, the famous astrophysicist. Oh, my gosh. And so I would, it was a wine class I was teaching. And um, I would, immediately after class, I'd sneak into his class, and I watched how he could do that. He could reach both. So when I'm teaching, um, I try to get to all audiences, and uh, the first advice I give them is to remember that they're smarter than the grill, that they have to outsmart it. They have to know what's going on. They have to understand what's going on. And the first step is thermometers. You have to know what temperature the meat is. You have to know what temperature your grill is. Grill is just an outdoor oven. You've got to know what the temperatures are. You've got to be able to control the temperatures. Um, and then we go from there. Yeah, yeah. No, I thought that was so cool. And then I read about you're a judge. You've been a judge all across the country. Yeah, I've judged. At a lot of different, all the different competitions and I've everything. judged steaks. I've judged yeah. barbecue. I've judged wine in California, New York, and Italy, uh, beer, booze, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow. So what do you hope people will take away from reading The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling with you? Well, I hope they'll learn how not to stick to the grill. You know, I want them to take away the concepts and techniques. Even if they don't use the recipes, mm -hmm. I think if they'll read the first half, they'll be able to make their own recipes up and when things go awry, when things don't happen the way you expect, when you run out of gas in the middle of the cook or uh, it's running too hot and it's yeah. almost done cooking and the guests don't arrive for two hours, yeah. you'll know what to do. Right, okay. Okay, so I end these interviews with a little quiz. You know all the answers, so it's kind of a lightning round. So okay, here we know. go. Okay, here we go. Okay, do you remember a favorite book when you were a kid? Ah, I read all the Winnie the Pooh books. Then uh -huh. I read all the Walter Farley Black Stallion books. Okay. And what do you remember as your favorite food when you were young? Um, my mom's uh, lasagna, homemade lasagna. Mm -hmm. I loved it. And my dad's uh, grilled flank steak. Okay. All right. Okay. Who, what is your, who's your favorite chef? Or even who, what's your favorite cookbook? Um, my new favorite cookbook. That's easy. It's a, it's a new book. Um, it used to be Julia Child's book, uh, mm -hmm. but it is now... Kenji Lopez Alt's The Food Lab, and oh. uh, it came out in this fall. It won an IACP cookbook award. It won a James Beard award. It's absolutely, utterly brilliant, and it has a lot of the same philosophy. Okay. And Kenji wrote it while living in an apartment, so there's no grilling, and people say that it, they're companions. They're, it's a great cookbook. And what would you say that book that you love more than anything in your entire life that you could not tell enough people to read it? Oh, my. I'm a huge fan of Lake Wobegon Days, Garrison okay. Keillor's books. Okay. Um, uh, there's, you can read it just for the stories and the jet laughs and the nostalgia, or you can go below the surface and great, get great profundity from it. Okay. All right, 100%, A+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Mita, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me, and congratulations on your cookbook, The oh, Science thank of you so Great much. Barbecue and can Grilling. Can you tell I'm a book person? Yes, I, I sure here. can. I yes. belong here. Yes. You, know, you, you are home. <laughs> I'm home, and I'm just thrilled that you guys carry the book yeah. and that you're my, my home bookstore. Yes. You know, I, uh, it's on the website. Uh, there's a link to here because if you want a personalized book, this is the only place to order it. What a delicious conversation we just had with Meathead Goldwyn about his new cookbook. It's called Meathead, The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling. Thanks for joining me on Authors Reveal. Thank you.